Hey everyone, welcome back. This is your host Brandy J with Voices of Courage. Today I have with me a amazing guest by the name of Christopher Clark. Christopher Clark is so sad. I'm have to do this. Christopher Clark is. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, you are a you're in you're certified in um, automotive management, right? It's oh, automotive yes. Ma management. Yes, and for 20 years, yes. right? You deal with a dealership. Uh, the, I know, the inventory management, just all the levels that have to come with, with um, having a, a deal. Yes. You, do you, let me start here. Christopher, can you tell the audience exactly what your why is? I don't know if you've ever been asked that, but your why, like why why are you in the field you're in and why do you do what you do and what makes you, you? Well, my father growing up was a auto body mechanic, meaning um, the term used back then was a panel beater. You know, those guys who will fix crash cars. So he could basically repair any car that is out there. Once it's in an accident, he will take his dolly and his hammer. That's what they called it back then. And then he will just beat the, the, um, the panel out back to crisp, um, apply the primer and the paint and everything, put it back together. And then the car will look just as new, right? So back then, persons who had an accident, they have a mind of fender bender, what they call it now. The, he will be the, the go-to guy to have that done. I will, I will, as a kid, I would normally go down to the shop to watch him work. And then on weekends, uh, yeah, on weekends, we'll assist him going down to the shop, watch him work, sometimes at work. Uh, he worked with a dealership, which later on, he got me into that field as well because he says, I, you know, I want you to follow my footsteps and learn a trade. But I didn't, I didn't like <laughs> being a... Or the auto body mechanic. So I wanted to go into the office because going to school, I was learning the business side of things. And then eventually I ended up working in the sales department at a Toyota dealership. And then later on at in the parts department, which later on I I became to I, I grew into it and I loved it after a while. Okay, okay. So you know, you just don't know the uh office, you know. You you know hands on basically so uh, yes yeah. and um, I became certified. Well, it's an ongoing certification because I've worked with Toyota, I've worked with Ford, I've worked with Subaru, Yamaha, Jeep, and as time goes by, while upgrade while doing personal development, getting my degree in business and everything, I also it also gave me the opportunity to travel all across the globe, attending workshops and seminars um, where we will, we will learn new stuff about inventory management, sales, leadership, inventory op optimization, uh, customer relations, management, everything you can think about. But every, time, every day along the line, every year along the line, we are expected to grow into the business and understand the changing dynamics that comes along with it. For example, if you notice, a new model car comes out every three years, then every two years, and now every year because the competition is so high. So you have to keep abreast of what is going on out there. Are you? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were going to um, interject. No, 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 no. I was just like um, fixing my seat. <laughs> <I'm so sorry. laughs> yes, like I said, yeah, a new model car comes out every every three years um, back then. I think it's like every year now because of they're doing constant upgrades to you have new features. And in that time, whenever a car comes out, the car will be sold based on the features you have. So you have a basic model, then you have a, a semi-basic model, and then you have another, another one that comes with all the upgraded features that you'll have, such as your chrome trims and your fender flares. And you now we have navigation system and reverse camera. And so as time goes by and as the technology improves, so as the prices and the competition to, to go along with it. Now, working in parts, may I, I may add, gave me that opportunity to, to keep up to date with what was trending at all times. So the technology, persons will be using the technology now. And then in terms of having it in their hand, no, it's all in your car. Because 20 years ago, a telephone 
will be in a cell phone will, will be placed inside a car. Imagine driving around with a handset, taking up that handset and dialing. And then that's an added feature. Now you'd have to purchase along with your telecommunications provider, right? Now we have Bluetooth and everything else. Everything is hands-free and you can drive your car with a navigation system on a screen. The a DVD, DVDs are no more, <laughs> if you believe it or not. Right. Person used to drive around, you know, um, popping in a CD or a cassette player inside their car. Now, everyone just uses their phone, up, up, upload their Bluetooth, and they, they cannot drive around hands-free, basically what it is. So I have seen an, a total evolution happening right before my very eyes while in this industry. Hmm, wow. So you have like a really broad um, perspective of, like you said, you know your stuff. You know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know everything, but I I try to keep up to date of the the latest trends that is that is happening out there. And because my father was the type of skilled individual he was, no, you that skill is no longer there. Now you have persons who they are in the trade, but what they do mostly is remove and replace, right? Um, certain cars that cannot, will no longer be able to be repaired, uh, it will be a total write-off. But you still have junkyards or yeah, the junkyards that will purchase those cars, still repair them, and you know send them to a different market, so to speak, which is called a great import market somewhere across the world. Because if a car ha in in particularly North America, if a car has a particular type of accident it will be seen as a write-off and then unworthy to be repaired and to be used on the roads because the airbags will fly and the sensors will fly and it will be too expensive to bring back. But that car itself can be boxed up, shipped somewhere else and then somewhere, someone in a third world country or they call it now developing countries will, will have no problem repairing that car and and put it put it out on the road because their maybe their regulations and and requirements are much more different than that of North America. So you we we have all of those information in mind while you know being in the business because you know you have to know exactly what goes on in one region which is different from another region, right? And um, while working in the industry itself, you will come across customers who will reach out to you and say, look. I I live in Istanbul, but I have a car that was purchased in your region. I would love to get this part. Can you help us out? And, you know, because of customer service, you try your best to assist that person, even if they're halfway around the world. Okay. And I was going to ask you, like, what what is your main uh, type of uh, client or customers? And I think that, well, that's probably like one, like people that need because you said in, they're in different regions and have a car, they they're one place, and then you know the 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 parts they need are in a whole other place. So is that based mainly your type? Uh, is that your service, your customer service base? Do you have a uh, like a variety to like companies? You have like just clients that need parts. Do companies refer to you? Like, do you have a set like a a more of a client base type? Oh yes. Um... If you're doing your, well, if you're doing your, I think called a KPI report, your monthly report, you should be able to break down your customer base and know exactly who your top cost, top priority customers are. For instance, if you work in a dealership, then every parts manager know that the garage or the, the service department will be their number one customer because they sell to them the most. Okay, mm -hmm. and then you have your over-the-counter customers. Now, the over-the-counter customers will comprise of different level of customers, as you just mentioned. You will have fleet customers, which are your large companies, and they have um, hundreds of cars, or car, right? And different models and everything, and you may have a contract with them to supply them parts. Then you have insurance companies, right who act on behalf of individuals such as yourself if you're involved involved in an accident and you notify your insurance company then they will act on your behalf get the estimate um approve your claim and then and say okay we're gonna these are the specified garages that you can take your car to for the necessary repairs to be done right and then you have the individual jobbers 
um, small shops that also sell parts, but they purchase from you at a, you know, a discounted um, level, of course, because everyone is in the business to make a profit. Okay, so you have that sales figure and then you can break it down. But you as the manager or myself, what I try to do is keep in touch with every single person because you have to know who your customers are. Right? <laughs> Mm -hmm. basically and it's 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 all about maintaining and building customer relationships yeah. uh customer relationship management but what i find not a lot of per not a lot of individuals particularly parts managers like myself not a lot of individuals who will get up out of get up off their asses out of the seat and go and visit that customer and say okay i see where your company or you have been purchasing from me i need to put a face to the to the um to the name you know, how are you? My name is Christopher Clark. I'm from such and such and such a dealership. How can I make it easier for you for, for us to have a better relationship going forward, right? So it's not just about sitting behind in an office or standing behind a counter and selling parts. It's much more than that. Right, right. It's about that. Like with anything, like with I me, mean, podcasting is like my audience is my, you know what I mean? I got to know my audience and, you know, it, it makes sense. Like it's like, to me, like a no brainer because, if you want good business, you your clients and your customers, that's the only way you're gonna have, you know, get good business. So it makes total yes. sense to cater yes. to get yes. to know what that relationship and yeah, definitely. And I'm glad that you mentioned that because you know, as a podcaster myself, you go into the anal the analytics and right. then you can see who your 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 customer base are, whether it's male or female or um the age range and where they're from, and then you can customize your right. platform to meet that audience so it's the same it's the same thing um that is why analyzing the data is very important and it's very important for individuals in management as a matter of fact to learn how to analyze the data um and to keep abreast of what is going on and to also try to improve you know one step further than where you are um, the previous month or the previous year and that is why companies they set targets right and the targets are the targets are never the same <laughs> so you have to keep moving yeah most definitely i know you also said on your talking points you uh there's training so within training is this like uh, something that you is a part of training for you is teaching uh like you know about the uh you know like the analytics and all that stuff how to you know, have an effective, like, business, you know, customer, you know, audience, like, I, I think because people need training in, like, dealing with, in any business, podcast, whatever, dealing with their, with their listeners, their audience, their clients, their customers, so that they feel like they want to, you know what I mean? It's not like, oh, you're just a customer, you're a client, they want to come to you, they feel like they know you, they can trust you. Yes, yes. And that's part of building um, the customer relationship. You one other thing you have to do, you have to build trust, right? And training is very important, especially to staff. And as the manufacturers evolve and they come up with innovative ways in order to, in order for dealerships to keep competitive and for themselves to keep up uh, competitive, you have to disseminate that information down to the staff members and say, okay, the, there's a new version of the dealer management system and this is, this is how it is done. And you keep the training based on that. And then you have other criteria of the training, whether it's communication skills, customer relations, management skills, um, doing reporting. And it goes and hand, in, hand in hand with getting your staff members to be competent. So there are different competence level that you want to get them to be, right? So in order for a parts manager, for instance, in order for, to be a parts manager, you need a degree, you need how much years of experience, you need to be this person meeting the sales target, you need to, we need to see what value, uh, what value added initiative you implemented to, to be so successful. For the front counter person, then you must have, you know, the written skills, the oral skills, the this, the that, you know, every little thing. And then you want to bring up this person into an inventory manager, and then you train them how to analyze and do the reports and the data and the purchasing and everything everything like that right so it the training encompasses everything but it's an also an ongoing process right and part of the training i try to emphasize with managers is to let them know that look 
the reports are always there because the manufacturers, they sent out a report of the best performing dealerships anywhere you are, even right now where you live. You can walk up to any dealership right now and, and, and ask them, where do you rank? Where, is, where does your manufacturer rank? Are you in the top 10? By then, you will know what type of dealership they are right? based on the service that they give you because they have to stay uh, relevant to what the manufacturer requirements are. Okay, And then they have to also meet particular criteria, a lot of criteria in order to stay relevant. So the training is very important. It's ongoing. And this is something that has, has fallen off a lot because after a while, I mean, we're human beings. Um, we get complacent. We, yeah, we, we think that everything will actually go the way we want it, not, not bemoaning the fact that it's an ongoing process because life happens and other stuff happens from time to time. So it's a, it's a, it's a revolving door. And one other thing that I try to emphasize also is best practice. Right, it's a term that it's a business term that was that was used and it was being pushed. But in quite recent time, I've not been hearing this anymore because the, the technology is so much in our face right now. I think that people just stay within the comfort of their own home and they can research anything on a computer with their smartphone, with their tablet, and the information comes there. But the part that is missing is that human element behind it, <laughs> right? Yeah. You know calling someone, meet with them and say, hey, let's do lunch. How do you, can I have a meeting to do such and such and such? I mean, you reach out to people with emails and you don't even get a response. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I think the humanity is, is going away from us and it's a, it's a sad case because uh, one famous quote I read is that social media has made it so possible that People can hide behind a keyboard or a screen and talk crap about someone else, which is, you know, it, it's sad. It's mm -hmm. sad. They call um, the keyboard they... bullies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they call them trolls and all different type of things. But, yeah. I mean, that's where we are right now. And you can't build anything without people. So true. So Nothing true. in life. You cannot build. You cannot do. No man is an island. You cannot build anything without people. So, we, you know, it. it yeah. it's... You need someone, well, in your corner at all times, or a few people to, to motivate you, to help push you. And that is why you, we always try to choose who we want to feel comfortable around, right? But, right. you know, that's another topic altogether. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true, because sometimes that's not the person you need. But, yeah, that is another topic. Yeah, sometimes yeah. sometimes we have to be uncomfortable to to get stuff done. You yes, know, like definitely. Yeah. yeah, because yeah. I... I'm a part of a, a Facebook group with my peers. And sometimes I will put a question out there to find get their feedback on the first 10 the first 10 answers is always something negative. And then someone else will come in and say, Hey, why are you doing that? The guy just asks a question, such and such and such. Right? You know, chill. Okay, let's try to be diplomatic. And, and then, you know, here are the advantages. And then there, here are the disadvantages. And why I think we should do it. And why I think we, we shouldn't do it. And then someone will come in and then they will share their expertise in terms of a SWOT analysis. You know, the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And they, you know, they go through all of that, right? And then what you find now is an ongoing conversation. And then you start seeing, you know, the real, in, the real people coming out now and taking taking charge of the situation right but you know you have to be the bigger person the individual will just sit back and just listen because this is this is where, where it is and if you're in management for a very long time especially dealing with people on a one-on-one -on -one basis such as the parts business right because people will come in they want a part you have to interact with them face to face at all times now they can do it over the phone it can be shipped to them anyone can go online no one purchase anything and Amazon or DHL or whoever, which courier company delivers it to the comfort, delivers it to you to the comfort of your own home, right? But the the business of working in a dealership it strengthens you as the individual in order to have that personal connection at all times. That's just one of the the biggest advantage I had while working in the industry. Um, it doesn't let you be an introvert. Okay.
I like, I like that you said that. So, um, okay. So all this being said, does, I know you have your book, um, the parts managed guide is, is that where the, this is inspired also from too, is this where people can get, you know, just, uh, for like, can a customer, can a client and someone in your field get something from the book? Oh, yes, definitely. It's, it, the parts manager's guide is just my personal experience of how to properly run a parts department. Mind you, it doesn't have everything because when I started writing it, like for the last five years, I had like over 300 pages. <laughs> and I didn't want anyone to just pick it up and throw it away. Right. So I said, you know what? I need it to be short. I need it to be yeah. spicy. Just go straight into the bullet points. And then I, I cut out a lot of things. So it's all the way down to around 35, 37 pages. And it just hit, it just hit the bullet points, right? The role of the parts department, the role of the parts managers. These are the things you're expected to do. The bin in the pack in the warehouse in the location. Um, location, the, the layout processes, the promotions, the advertising, um, the 10 steps I have in there in order for you to get your department running efficiently. So those are some of the things I have. And also... For anyone outside of the space of the automotive business can read it and say, okay, so this is what a parts manager should be doing. Or, you know, um, The most successful parts manager actually uses these points that I've mentioned about it. But one of the things that motivated me to write this book was um, uh, a co-worker of mine, right? Who she contributed so much to the industry helped me helped a lot of people right throughout working at a particular dealership i won't mention the name and um, sadly she passed away because of covid but a tribute was sent out to her and then i read the tribute it was nicely done tribute by the company it was nicely done and everything but i i looked at it and i said but no apart from us who worked directly with her Nobody else knows who she is, right? And then this gave me the opportunity to say, to say okay, let me start interviewing people who work in the field. What's it, what, it is, what is it like working in a dealership, working in, in sales, working in service, working in accounts, being a warranty officer, working in IT? What, are the, what were the challenges you had? What, um, what were some of the changes that you witnessed throughout the years? What were some of the biggest challenges? The, um, what, what helped you to grow? What inspired you? What, was, what is your takeaway from all this? Because when I went into it and I started interviewing all these people and all the interviews, they're on my YouTube channel, The Parts Manager Professional. Um, I have a lot of videos there. And they will tell you their journey right throughout it. Right. And then you listen and then, they, you know, they, everybody emphasize the same thing. But it was so disheartening after a while, because while searching for content in that thing, you will also come across other videos of individuals sharing their bad experiences. <laughs> right. Going to a dealership because everyone has this fear or their own interpretation that the dealership is just there to take your money. Mm -hmm. and to rip you off mm -hmm. and, the mechanic is, and the mechanic is there to to jam you know <laughs> to, right. to you know to pull one over on you mm -hmm. and you know and they mostly do it to females and yeah um, I was gonna women say must that, be, yeah. Mo yeah women must be you know very cognizant of when they go there they should be prepared because the mechanic will try to do this and they'll try to do yeah. that and i'm saying yo i mean but the negative the negatives outweigh the positives you get, if you get what I'm saying, it totally yeah. outweighs the positives. For So for me to see someone now go on TikTok and say, you know, the other day I went to a dealership and the salesman said this and this and that, and he tried to rip me off and blah, 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 blah. And then it goes on and on and on. And I'm sitting back and I'm looking back at the the background part of it, part of it. Because I've worked in it and I'm close to it, I might sound biased, but... The thing is, that's just one individual. Right. It's not the entire building or the entire company. So if you have a problem with that one particular individual, call him out. Go to his manager, write a letter, 
let the company discipline that individual and get get something in writing from that dealership and say you know we are we are we apologize such and such and such and we will ensure that this will never happen again yada 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 you get what i'm saying but no we are so reactive that our first line of defense is throw a video out on social media right right and then we throw everything in the what they call it now the the public's opinion <laughs> right yes. and then have <laughs> them you know have them support you and say and then someone else will come and, and come and say yes because i went to someone else and this happened to me as well and yeah and it, and it goes on because mind you it have it's it's very easy for a mechanic to rip you off it's very easy if uh and that's one of the reasons why manufacturers came in with a thing called a flat rate system because they said okay in order to perform a particular job on a car it's going to take x hours here's what here's what the rate is in order to, to stem that but a mechanic can put put an additional 20 dollars or an, an additional 50 dollars on it <laughs> we'll never know so it's so easy to get that done but believe it or not it's it's not a broad brush situation because you have so many mechanics out there um, doing so much good, but they're never highlighted. But we always seem to identify the bad ones, the bad apples, yeah. right? Yeah. Making it bad for everybody else. And, yeah. and it's sad. Yeah. Um, and to support that, I have some a series on my YouTube channel as well, some shorts that shows. It's a series called How, Me How Engineers Keep Mechanics Miserable. I have almost a, a hundred shorts on that. Download it from TikTok, of course, because these mechanics show how difficult it is to reach certain parts just to have them removed and replaced and repaired. So if someone comes in, so for instance, you have a car, you just need an oil filter done, and the mechanic says, oh, it's going to cost you $130. And you're like saying, what? Just to drain and refill the oil and screw on a filter? That's ridiculous. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? But <laughs> yeah, but if you... If he should show you, bring you around the back and say, look, the oil filter is behind the manifold, which is behind the wiring diagram, which is behind something else just to get to that filter. He has to take down 25 bolts and, and lift off an entire manifold just to get to a particular, um, particular point, which is going to take at least two and a half to three hours. Right? So, you know, it, 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 it's things like those. That I'm glad that you know the, the the positives of the technology will now allow you know the layperson to see and say, oh, and so that's what it. they have to go through. Yeah. 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 So that's 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 one of the reasons. And also being in in this industry, um, it allows me to you know use my experience and use a platform I have to highlight these things, right? Because this is one of the professions that are slowly going away is being a mechanic mm. dealerships right now find it hard challenging and difficult to get to find mechanics and to bring the younger generation to learn a skill and say look you can make good money from this just learn the basics because mechanics are the one who, go, who are the ones who goes off and do aeronautical engineering and they work on locomotives like the trains and the and the airplanes and you know so many other different things out there elevator mechanics you can even go and go and learn that and they're lucrative and they pay so most of these jobs they pay more than a hundred thousand dollars but a lot of people don't know this they only see the mechanic as a, a grease monkey back exactly. in the day yeah but believe it or not the these mechanics they if they they can easily make a hundred thousand dollars in less than a year wow yeah but that's you awesome know, that you said that. Yeah, not just like the can. too. We don't really broaden those. Like you know, you said they see the mechanic as the grease monkey, or or just like plumbers or people that put the floor the flooring. You know, you don't realize yeah. all the work that comes in. Like you're standing on this floor, and you wouldn't be if somebody did. You know what I mean? You wouldn't be driving if the mechanic didn't do. You know, you didn't have the mechanics. But you're like in education, they they don't. I know in my, I was born in 78. And so like right around the end, I think it was junior high, they were still doing like wood shop and mechanics and stuff. And mm -hmm. I don't think they do that stuff like that anymore. Give um, our youth or, like skills, like real skills that you can provide for yourself. You know, even if you lose 
You know what I mean? Like uh, yeah. uh, stop working at a company or something like that. And and let show those show those type of jobs is like you know where yeah the 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 blue collar worker yeah the, everything that you're enjoying right now you're sitting down inside your home everything exactly. around you was built by a blue collar worker mm -hmm. everything the books on your shelf <laughs> right the yeah. shelf was built by a blue collar worker the the chair you're sitting in your computer everything is from a blue collar worker the food on the shelf, the truckers right the farmers everybody everything was a blue collar worker so mm -hmm. they they don't get the respect that, that they mm -hmm. deserve so it's always so easy to look down on those individuals yeah. and part of the thing that i am happy that i low i know a lot of mechanics and i give them the respect they deserve because believe it or not you're driving on the road and you break down um who you're gonna call <laughs> Ghostbusters. <laughs> <laughs> Not the Ghostbusters, exactly. <laughs> so the the tow truck guy is gonna turn up and he's a blue collar worker. He's gonna, you know, either fill you with gas or help change that tire or you know, try to repair something on your car, or he's gonna take that car to someone else who will repair that car for you. Right. right? So I mean it it encompasses so many different things, but the automotive industry it has contributed so much to, um, to this world. And because of a few bad eggs, we, we can't continue to, to knock the individuals. I mean, yeah. the salesman is who he is, <laughs> right? I've had my fair share of um, salespersons, and they are who they are. And they work on commissions, and they see themselves as prima donnas, right? So they're the guys who they walk around in the suits, and they, they try to look the part. So you can't take that away from them. And numbers matters to them at the end of the day. But, you know, you go there with all your information. And the information right now is everywhere. It's in books. It's on, you, it's on YouTube. It's on every social media platform to say, okay, you want to buy this car. It's for X amount. It's for X price. You can, uh, every manufacturer now offers the, the ability for you to build and buy. So you can go online, look at the particular car you want. You can build that car to the specification you want it. But they will direct you to the dealership and say, okay, this is where you purchase the car. You have all that information. So if you get screwed over by a sales by a, by a salesperson or a dealership, it's your fault. Right. <laughs> That's basically what I'm saying, <laughs> right? You didn't so, educate yourself. Yeah, first. <laughs> yeah. so right. I mean, you know, you, know, you deserve it based on, based on how I see it. So right. that's, it is what it is. Because that salesman should possibly, if he's good at what he does and cares, he should be able to answer those questions that you went online to, to make sure, you know, that you cover and make yeah. sure. That's how you. Yeah, do it, you yeah. Know? You're you're signing you're signing a contract, so right. it is important for you to read that contract. If you don't like something, say okay, you're gonna take this one out, take this one out, take this one out. How much this one costs? I don't need this one. I don't need that one because they're they are going to pad a lot of things inside it, yeah. and then you should determine whether or not you wanna you don't wanna pay for it, right? right? For me, extended warranty and all these other little things that uh, no, uh, if you don't wanna pay for it, just take it out. Right, so it's totally up to you. Right, yeah, that is. I appreciate that you're saying all this because it makes a lot of sense too. I'm just looking at it a, in a broader aspect too. Like it's your life, your your, you know what I mean. This vehicle, you know, that you're gonna be in. That's a very. It could be a dangerous, you know, situation. Yeah. Your life. To me, it's just like um, putting things in your body. You don't know what it is. What else? Exactly. Yep. yep. <laughs> and. Uh, and the parts manager guide now is the parts manager is a person now, along with the service manager, who now have the issue of ensuring that you remain happy. Because after you purchase that car and you go through the app, you go to the door, the sales department should in fact keep in touch with you. How is your ride? How is it going? Um, we would like to invite you back to a workshop for you to understand your car better. And these are the things you need to look out for. Not a lot of dealerships do those either, right? <laughs> and then the, the parts manager, the service manager now should be sending you, you know, weekly, monthly reminders, letting you know, okay, at, at maintainers in the, um, intervals, these are things that are needed that your car should need or you should be doing in order to keep your car healthy on the road. So the parts manager is a person now who ensures that 
whenever you need something, they will also have to have that part in stock at all times, whether you're going to make an appointment or not. So it is important for them to ensure everything is on either on standby or, or on or an order, or they have to do back orders and they have to tell you exactly how long before that part comes in. And otherwise from doing inventory management and customer satisfaction and everything else, then you have the reports and um, to try to keep the the department as efficient as possible running like a you know a well-oiled machined um, because you have to meet the targets and some dealerships make it even more even more better to to be working there even more beneficial by offering additional remuneration packages like incentives and and bonuses in order to meet certain targets and then because because of where we reside especially here in North America, um, Canada, of course, I'm in Toronto, we have winter tire season, right? So that time comes in, no, we have to, you have all these appointments, persons have to be changing out all their all season tires into winter tires, and you have to keep the various stocks of those tires, whether it's size 14, 15, 16, 17, up to 21, 22, and the different, the different width and the height, the, two, the 205, 15, um, 215, 70, 13, 217, 45, um, 45, 30, all these different sizes, right? So it, it comes with the territory, and it's so ironic that because we have to we have to stay abreast of everything that goes around most times if not all the time you will have your allocation fill rate and this is something i'm going to explain right that of allocation fill rate goes by of the amount of parts that someone requests you're able to fill 97 percent of it all the time because you have that on stock but people still complain about the three percent that you're unable <laughs> to, to fulfill. Right? So I mean, I always find it ironical that you know we always emphasize on that 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 three percent that we're <laughs> unable to to fulfill, and it, they make a big mountain out of it. But <laughs> it comes it comes to the territory. Yeah, it's a negative, <laughs> right? <laughs> wow. Okay, I, I really love that you're explaining this because. Um, because people don't really think about this stuff. And then it also, uh, for me, I was going to ask you also, like, what, what, and I think I can answer this myself, what makes you different? What puts you in a whole different category than most, um, you know, parts dealers? And, and I think it is because of your, your positivity and then also your appreciation for people's work and also uh, your customer, the, the, the care you have for your, your customers. You know, because you said a lot of people don't, a lot of dealerships, they don't, they don't do that. And I think if, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, but is that what you would say would separate you and it puts you in a whole different category is the customer relationship and the care and positivity that you put into the business? Well, yes, the, I was trained to, to be customer focused because without the customer, the business can't survive. Right. I mean, <laughs> you won't. You won't have that. You won't have that drive in order to do your job unless you get positive feedback from your customers. The customers determine whether or not your business is going to survive. And having traveled extensively through the Caribbean, I've been able to see how different people react in different regions, in different countries. And I will ask these questions, and then their systems are also different. And when I went to a particular region, I went to the uh, I went to South Africa, and in different regions, let me keep repeating the same thing. In different regions, they focus on different things. On this side of the world, we're sales focus. It's all about meeting the sales numbers, right? Because we try. People in North America, they tend to change their car more regularly than outside North America itself. Someone will keep their car for 10, 15 years, up to 25 years, as long as that car can drive, as long as, they, it's, it's, as, long as it's economical to keep maintaining that car, they will keep that car. And then parts and service comes in and have to maintain that car 
and also maintain the customer relation in order for that customer to keep coming back to you if you understand what i'm saying yeah. so in north america we just concentrate on putting out ads of the new car the, oh the new sonata is out and the new bmw and the new honda is out and everybody wants to want to change a new car yeah. you yeah. you live in a particular community and then you see your neighbors changing right. their car every other year <laughs> <laughs> exactly but in different regions it's all about maintaining that customer relationship because you want to keep that customer once that customer purchases a car and, and he's gone you have to try to reach out to get them back to come and service that car and something i always emphasize every time i talk i talk about the absorption rate and the absorption rate is in 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 the automotive field is when parts and service combined right um total the amount of the, the amount of profit or the amount of sales that the parts and service combined makes outweighs that of the sales department. In other words, if you sell a car, it will be straight bonus to your to your to your dealership. So parts and service covers all the expenses of your of your dealership in the business entity. And dealerships outside of North America tend to want to do that right because they know that the competition is tight some markets are extremely small because you have some markets they can only sell combined a com the combined amount of manufacturers and dealerships can only sell more can sell no more than 5000 5000 cars for the year whereby in north america now we're doing <laughs> we're doing um in the hundreds of thousands right so well, there's no need to you know look at parts and service as 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 important in this field but outside of outside of north america they have to because you want you want to maintain that fleet company that is by that is going to buy 100 cars from you every year and you want to ensure that a fleet company comes back to your garage and those cars are passing through one day the parts department is on top of their game the service manager is on top of his game they're going out and introducing themselves and try to get new business then you have to do things like uh i call it consignment stock whereby you will set up satellite depots in different regions of the country depending on the size of the size of your country of course and it will make it more accessible for people who live in different areas of a particular region to have access to your service so it depends again it depends on the country you reside in and then you have to think outside the box at all times how are we going to maintain and how are we going to improve and how are we going to keep satisfying our customer base? I think like everything else in the North America, we take for granted. <laughs> right? yes. So Very yeah, <laughs> and they don't realize how tough, you know, some parts of the world have it and mm -hmm. the enormous, the enormous responsibilities that they have to endure. Um, let me give you this personal experience. Uh, when I was in Jamaica, I had a staff complement of up to 27 people inside a parts department that I had to manage. When I came here to Toronto, our staff complement is only three, <laughs> right? And we had to basically do everything. And But our parts department here was like, uh, when I call it now, maybe around 5,000 square feet. Whereas in the Caribbean, our parts department is almost 50,000 square feet upstairs and downstairs and elevator <laughs> shafts and you know and you're running around and you, i use talk everything from a pin to an anchor if you if you understand what i'm saying right yeah. over three over three million line items as wow. compared to here we had maybe just less than five thousand line items so it it varies depending on where you are and in my book i try to you know get everyone to understand that look these are the responsibilities that they the 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 parts manager does whether you work here with less responsibility or you're in a region with with more responsibilities right yeah. so these are the methods and the and the strategies you can use to improve as you go along but the part i emphasize most of the times is building customer relationship because that's that parts manager in trinidad or Barbados, or in Malawi, or in South Africa, he has to get up off his ass and go look for 
um, XYZ company and set up a meeting and shake their hand and sit down and, and ask them, how can we improve our services to make things better for you? Yeah. And then he has to sit there and listen to the, the insults and the criticism and the ridicule that his company, his dealership is doing. And he says, okay, thank you for that. He has to accept it. I said, okay, going forward, here's what we're going to do. So you're sitting down around the table and you're, you're negotiating. And you have to do that at least once a month. Write down a list of all the garages and, and, and shops in and around your area. And you go out and you look for them and say, and say I am such and such and such from ABC dealership. You know, here's what we can offer you. What are your expectations of us? And you bring that human element to it. Uh, well, because of COVID, no, you can't shake anyone's hand. But uh, yeah. I mean, when things get back to normal, that's that's one of the biggest things that I recommend. And you, believe it or not, you will see a vast improvement in the way people will appreciate you, damn, you taking out the time to come and look for them and that you presented yourself and you're being sincere. Yeah. Um, after a while, they will, you know, you 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 do follow up with them and bring along with you um, a credit application form and say, okay, we're offering you, you know, <laughs> five five hundred dollars in credit, five thousand dollars in credit purchase from us is a is a thirty day, thir um thirty day credit application standard. Uh, you you take the parts from us, you pay us within such and time, and then as 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 their purchases purchasing improves then you increase their purchasing limit as time goes by and trust me it will it will happen but you have to like every business you have to make that first step and then you have to be consistent at it yeah consistency is key yes, <laughs> yes very much so uh, to me i i mean it's a, to me it's like a no-brainer when it comes to like the whole customer element like even with uh podcasting i find it like i try to focus a lot on the listeners, the audience and what they like, you know what I mean? And to, to keep them excited because who would listen to it if I didn't have it? <laughs> I would listen to myself, right? So it's yeah. really about, you know, my audience, my listeners. And I feel like also too, even with you, you know, explaining all this, it's um, if you want a, a good business, like if you're in business, who wants to have crappy business? Like, why'd you go into business? Everybody wants a great business. Well, then number one is your customers. And like, I think like you said, you put that human element into it and, and then word of mouth. And then those will be the very people to tell their friends, tell their families, you keep those customers around for a long time, you know, and that brings you, you barely have to do much work because it's working for itself, like a ongoing. So I yeah. think that's like the number one thing is always the customer relations and making it personal, yeah. like you said. Yes, yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Definitely it does. So that was that is one of the things that was emphasized in my training. And then when I learned all that, I brought it back and it actually worked. Um, it awesome. may not work here, but you mm -hmm. you never know until you try. Yeah, because yeah. I I did some of that. <laughs> um and this is a true story. When I because I had that experience working at a dealership here. I proposed it to my manager then, and he said, go ahead, let's see what happens. And then we got called out for it because other dealerships in and around the area start calling us and say, hey, you're poaching our customers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because the customers went back and said, you know, they got a visit from such and such and such, and they're going to start buying from them. Or what happened is that the customers stopped buying from those dealerships and started buying from us. <laughs> and then those, yeah, yeah and then <laughs> those dealerships will call the customer and say, hey, we haven't seen you, such and such and such. What's happening? Or they, they, they completely pull their businesses from those dealerships and start purchasing from us. So it's, uh, I, I did it here and it worked, right? But like I said, you can try it. Uh, well, the listeners, of course, they can try it and see what works for them. The the as you mentioned again the human touch has to come with it depending on the type of business you're in go out there reach out let them know um that you know you're available and this is what you have to offer once you can pinpoint the type of business that you're doing you have to do your your investigation to know who your customers are and where they are and what the reach is Awesome. I love it. I love it. I didn't, I'm so engaged. I like, I love this. I wasn't, you know, I knew I wanted your voice to come on. I knew you had, I told, I think you, before we had, you said, well, how, what would I talk about? You know, like, 
you know, the fields you're in. I was like, oh, we'll find something. And that's <laughs> easy because this is well, your place and it's important. There, thank you, because there is not a lot of space for my content. Um, I may be the only one that talks about the, the parts department, but I talk about a lot of other things within the automotive space itself. But you can find a lot of them, but you have much more people talking about cars and their features and what right. they're pricing and, and, um, and the sales and, and everything else. But nobody talks about what goes on inside the dealership itself and behind the scenes. Okay, right. so that's what I wanted to do. So I didn't want to be a part of that, um, that paradigm that is already there. Exactly. <laughs> uh, and, and, and adding to it. Um, there's so much different things we can discuss in the world. So uh, I built my own door. You know, when they say when an opportunity knocks, you you don't open it. You, you, just, you, you build your own door. And that's, that's basically what I'm trying to do. And hopefully okay. it's, it gets out there. Um, when I went on to, you know, trying to find content, content, I went onto Facebook and I found other persons who have the experience like myself. And there are, there are also others that don't have the experience that need help. And I said, wow, because I found a group with almost 10,000 people within the parts industry on their sharing ideas going right across. And I said, okay, so there is a market <laughs> out there that, you know, needs advice and needs assistance. And, you know, how at the end of the day, we have to ask ourselves, how do we add value to, to, to someone's life? Um, whether we're doing something good or something bad, but what is the takeaway from all of it? Because, yeah. you know, we, we, if you're you're a content creator and you know you're gonna be on certain social, social media, media. Um, sites out there, there's so much so much going on, so much noise. It's yeah. it's unbearable because people are more focused on drama than anything else, and it takes away from the real people that are ensuring that you know the food is on the shelf the light is in your house the water is in your pipe yeah exactly all, like all yeah. that and it's all about just me 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 every day and i mean That's you know so issue. yeah we have to you know um take um sit back unwind and you know get your get your thoughts back together and say, so how can I make a positive change in this world? Not many per persons are able to to do just that. I am doing something that I love. Um, I'm passionate about because I can relate to it. I can tell you all about it. So if you ask me the question about parts and the dealership, I can tell you exactly what's going on. Um, then you have a lot of people in, you have a lot of yeah. mechanics. Yeah doing also DIY videos and believe it or not they get a lot of traction because people want to know how it's done as well right so when you watch those mechanics and some of them their productions are really really fantastic the quality is good the sound is good they take the time out and you know and cut and edit and put this thing out and they all they should be um, commendable commended I mean they're growing their numbers if you look at the YouTube numbers where they were and where they are now they're growing and I'm happy that now the technology has enabled us to, you know, get into this space and be a part of it and contribute it, contribute so much more. Because we we there are so much for people to learn. And yeah. I'm happy for in terms of YouTube and why I say this, because anything at all you want to do and want to learn about, there's a YouTube video for it. Anything. <laughs> yeah. Very true. Very true. So why not, why not create a space that if a parts manager want to to learn something or understand something, hey, uh, there is always me, and hopefully more persons will, more experienced parts manager can get into the space and also assist and say, okay, here's what we can do as well, and get it out there because it's not boring. I don't know why people think it's <laughs> it's boring, but it is not boring once you understand the numbers, once you understand inventory management and you can explain it in such a way that people will find it exciting. And But the, the working in a dealership, it's a fast-paced industry. 
and I tell people all the time, if you work in a dealership for a particular number of years, you can work anywhere. Absolutely mm. anywhere. Because especially at a corporate dealership that just focus on the numbers. <laughs> you they will they will push you because all they want to see is the numbers. Everything else is is secondary. The numbers are more important. Hmm. Well, I'm I, I I've learned a lot today. Like I'm like you taught me so much, like even like having the right questions when I and you know when I do decide to purchase, you know, because I have right now, but purchase an automobile, but also the things you're talking about, you can apply them in so many different areas. Yeah. You know, yes. or fields and stuff. And so I've really just like, I'm like, you can't tell, but in my head, <laughs> I'm like really excited right now. I have so many ideas, like you just like really made it make sense even more. So I appreciate you for coming out here. And I know I know there's yeah, so much you. more levels and more to more to talk about. Um, I know you also have your own podcast on um, YouTube um, and then there's your book. And so I would love for, to make sure that the listeners know exactly if their social media, where they can find, find you at. Oh, yes. Me, my social media angle is parts manager pro uh, Instagram, uh, the parts manager professional on on Facebook, Parts Manager Pro as well. Twitter is the same, Parts Manager Pro. Uh, YouTube, which I post most of my my content. Also, uh, it's the, the Parts Manager Professional on YouTube, as well as I have my own podcast entitled Parts Talk uh, with host Chris Clark, my dealership experience. And I talk about the things happening in the automotive world itself. One that thing after the other, after another. Um, Electric vehicles are upon us, and yes, people need to yeah. <laughs> EVs, but, yeah, government is pushing it. Governments mm -hmm. uh, from various countries are pushing it, uh -huh. and people need to understand that uh, what are the workings behind purchasing one, maintaining one. Um, <laughs> is it for you? <laughs> is it budget? <laughs> but there's every in everything. There's also a cause and effect. Because my latest episode I spoke about, will EVs kill gas stations? Because, you know, you, a gas mm -hmm. station has a convenience store. You stop there and then you can get everything you want. No, with no gas to purchase, what are you going to do? <laughs> right? Um, so that's, those, a work, huh? that's a lot of work. And believe it or not, a lot of companies are going to be affected because you're talking about from a pin to an anchor, you can get inside a convenience store at a, at a gas station. So if People are if EVs are gonna cause charging stations all around the country and thing, people won't see the need to go to a, a gas station anymore or a convenience store at a gas station. They're gonna have to be turning into motels and using up the space for all different type of things. So there 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 is a lot of <laughs> things happening there, right? Mm -hmm. And much. also all the, the manufacturers now competing against each other each other who can get the best car out there for the dealerships now they also have to revamp the way they operate itself. And it will also cause maybe a lot of people to be out of a job, believe it or not. Because depending on the size of the dealership, they employ up to 200, 300 people at a time. Mm -hmm. And you're looking at a lot of mouth, mouths to feed. Yeah. Because, yeah, because a dealership has helped me to buy my house and send the kids through school and college, send, my, send myself through college. And it is something that we have to look into in the long run. Yeah. And believe it or not, anything at all that happens inside the world, whether it's a natural disaster, um, a volcano erupting or a tsunami, something happening anywhere in the world, an economic, down, um, economic downturn, the dealership is always the first to, to get affected because they're dependent on sales and they're dependent on parts and service. So if people can't afford to purchase a new car, they're going to keep their car long, longer. Yeah. If that dealership depends on car sales, they're doomed, right? And not focusing on their absorption rate. If that dealership that focus on the service side of things and the part side of things and people can't afford to come to your dealership anymore. He will real rather go to John Brown shop around the corner 
or call up his friend and invite him over and bam, pop, on, pop on the computer and research a YouTube video and do it yourself, then the dealership is also going to be affected, right? Mm-hmm. So there are so many different facets to it that we you have to look into to these things. Yeah. Yeah. And it gives them so, more control. Like if the electrical car is like, isn't that like you can't shut off somebody's gas like out there, you know, like when you know people come like we want our car back and make a payment. You know what I mean? Because if it's electrical, then that means that if stuff systems go down, mm-hmm. it doesn't that stop people, yeah. you know, and yeah, it, so, yeah. And, and I, I spoke about a number of right. Yeah. You're right. I'm a car. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, we spoke about that as well on my podcast. That um, because two weeks ago we had a huge snowstorm here in Toronto, almost sixty centimeters of snow, and people were stuck in their cars on the highway for hours. Oh, wow. well, imagine sitting down in a in a in an electric car. <laughs> <laughs> You, know, you get what I'm saying, and there was no way anyone can get to you. So we uh, there there are a number of things we have to to look into. I understand, you know, we we are moving towards um, zero emission, but there are the little things we need to get to get in place as well. So, yeah. I mean, it's it's one thing after the other, and there's so many subsidiaries or facets or you know. Um, components to the automotive industry that I could I could go on and on and on and on it affects everyday life mm-hmm. it affects everyday life yeah. I mean and I sh- if I should go back to the mechanic if you don't have enough mechanic you won't have you won't have enough persons to fix those trucks to get those to get the food on the supermarket shelf Right, that's true. It's all like a chain, like it's like a whole like domino, yeah. like <laughs> it is, it is, it is. And then sometimes you go to the airport and you have a flight, and the flight is cancelled, all because that that aircraft broke down, and uh, the mechanic who is to they can't find a proper mechanic to work on that, or they don't have the part available. And then you're sitting at the airport for like nineteen hours. Right. Getting angry, finding out what is going on because yeah. that aircraft broke down on a on a Saturday or a Sunday, and the part shop is not open. <laughs> I mean, you're not thinking that, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so people don't, like, yeah, people don't think beyond, you know, that scope. Okay. That you know, sometimes that's what happened. You know, but I've seen it. I've seen it before. They said, okay, that 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 aircraft broke down. Um, it need a particular part to you know to be repaired. Then they have to send for another fl- for another flight that is going to take at least another seven and a half hours for that mm-hmm. aircraft to come to you right. in order for you to get on that one. Those are the things that happen behind the scenes and people don't know. Yeah, they don't think about any of that stuff. Just like I can't get on this flight. None of the things that are going on that you know, yeah. like the yeah. next. So, the so next logistics aircraft. is also yeah. Logistics plays. There. <laughs> logistics plays a very 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 important part right now um may if i may add one last thing there is also the the chip shortage going on in the in the industry um a lot of manufacturers they're unable to meet their targets because the the chip shortage is, is on and uh, there's a supply chain problem going on right now because of covid you have shipments being backed up and everything so it's 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 a mess out there but if you work in the industry, whether in automotive supply chain management or logistics or anything like that, you will definitely understand what's going on out there. But to the regular person who wants to, what do you call it now, floss <laughs> and party and going out and you know and take selfies and and be nar- express narcissism, they won't understand what's going on out there. At all, lack of they appreciation. Won't. Yeah. Yeah, it was all like you said, me, 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 me. <laughs> yeah. 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 Man, That's man. our current society, the me culture. So, yeah. yeah very much so. Oh, man. You just, I, I really, really loved this um, this episode here. You explained so much. This is so important. I know the listeners are going to love it. Definitely, we have a radio show too. So, I'm definitely going to put it, you know, up on there. We'll feature your book, um, do a, maybe a promo, put it on our website. And, and just Thank really you. help boost what you do because you are what you do is very important and you have what people need and what they yeah, should the want. Yeah, the book will the the book 
I haven't released it yet. Uh, it will the ebook version will be released the end of this month, and then the hardcover will be the first week in March. So I'm just doing the promo now to you know to get okay. the um, the emphasis up. But okay. it will That's be released. Yeah, both of them will be on, um full released um the first week in March, guaranteed. Okay, so Amazon, right? Amazon, yes. Um, for now, Amazon only. Um, both both ebook and hardcover the first week in march okay. it will be made available yeah awesome awesome this was great i could have i had so many other stuff i could ask you but the d you know it, it it that's why you have a podcast because you have there's so many levels to it but you covered so much that i'm excited about putting this putting this out and um letting people see the appreciation but also because the way you explain it and the care you know, you have within what you do, you would hope that people are in fields. I, 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 you know, really like motivate people to do things that they love. I never was into like having jobs that you don't like, I don't like, I don't, Yeah. it's not, if, if you love it, it's not a job, you know, yeah. but you, your passion behind it will show. And I'm yes. really for people doing things that they love because it benefits them, the, the customers and just the all around better service. And, and I love how you came on here and you just shared that with so much passion. And well, well, thank you for thank you for having me and giving me the time, the um, the platform to express my passion. Um, this is this is something I've been doing for twenty years, and uh, I love what I do. I, I can tell. I, 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 yeah, I really <laughs> love what I do. <laughs> mm -hmm. I can totally tell. I can yeah, totally. and I appreciate I appreciate you and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And you're always welcome back here because I got questions, you know, and I would love for you to, you know, at another time, you know, come back and we'll dig into some, you know, other aspects or and maybe even like talking to like a uh, uh, women, you know, how you have that thing like women and they don't know about cars and, you, you know, you can't trust the mechanic, you can't trust them, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. Because so, there's so many levels, but it's still bringing back that, uh, like that human, you know. And um, for women, if they want to learn more, they can also get it from another woman, um, Patrice Banks of City Girls Auto. I'm giving her a free promo here. Um, she has her, you can you can Google her. Um, she has her own shop. Um, she's a mechanic, an engineer by um, by profession. She has her own shop, and she trains women to un to to be mechanics, and she tr also trains women to understand their cars and everything. So she, uh, the website is there, um, City Auto Clinic. Yeah, that's the right name of it. And you will see her, her awesome. entire autobiography on it. Um, very impressive. I also did a, a, um, a clip on her as well. And the video is up on my YouTube channel. But you can go directly to her website and, and see everything. That's awesome. That's, that's amazing that she does what she does. Okay. Yes. I, I, I was very impressed when she, when I when I found her. So I, right. I had to do a, I had to do a um an article on her as well, and I had it out there. Awesome. Oh, I love that. I love it. Empowering. <laughs> well, once again, because for I I'm just like oh, just you made my day. This was like the best um ever. I can't wait to put this out and. uh like I said, you're more than welcome here. I will we will promo your stuff. Uh, when your book is out, please let us know so that we can um, put it up on the website and also drop promos on uh, the radio. And I'll send you the links and stuff too if you want to check out the Definitely. Video. Thank you. Yes, most definitely. So um, once again, everybody, this is the amazing <laughs> Christopher Clark. Definitely check them out. I'll put all your links in the show notes. And uh if there's anything you want to say before we head out, if you have like a, if you have like a quote or anything that you tell people, not necessarily. I just tell people to um, do your passion. I like it. Do your passion. Um, you have an you have an idea. Doesn't matter how small it is. Um, get it out there and start working. Don't just keep dreaming and wishing. Just just get out there and do it. Uh, anything is possible, and it doesn't matter how small it is, um, just start, start somewhere. Um, I'm small now, but hopefully, you know, it will grow. And this is something that I'm going to be doing for a very long time. But, you know, as young content creators out there, not in age, of course, but I mean, we're just starting out, but you have your passion out there, get it out there. You, you, may, you may never know what yeah. it is. And I was motivated to, to write a book about it now. And I'm happy that, 
it is out there for you know adding value to to society itself so that's that's the basis of things we are we're on this earth to serve yes right so yeah. that's basically what it is we we live a life of servitude and then people will always find hope and value in what you're doing and as long as you can put that out um you will be welcome yes i love it (laughs) (laughs) thank you so much thank you so much thank you i'll be more than happy to uh, be a part of your show anytime Um, you have my link so you know put it out there and i'll I'll be ready yes and i follow you on instagram and facebook and twitter definitely instagram and facebook yes yes thank you Thank you. Okay, everybody. Well, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with me and Christopher Clark here on Voices of Courage. Until next time, peace.